wygląda na to, że minęła godzina 13, także witamy wszystkie osoby, które dołączają właśnie do naszego dzisiejszego specjalnego webinara. Proszę dajcie nam znać na czacie, czy nas widać i słychać. To jest specjalny webinar, powód jest szczególny, okoliczności też są szczególne. Trwa inwazja Rosji na Ukrainę. My w ubiegłym tygodniu z zespołem ESETA też byliśmy uczestnikami konferencji Semafor w Warszawie. Jednym z prelegentów był obecny dzisiaj tutaj z nami Robert Lipowski. Robert już od 13 lat zgłębia wiedzę na temat różnych działań cyberprzestępców, technik, taktyk, procedur. Odpowiedzialny za zespół badaczy w siedzibie Główny jest etap w Bratysławie, jest prelegentem, który zbiera świetne noty na różnych konferencjach właśnie branżowych, na Blekacie w USA, też na polskich konferencjach takich właśnie jak Semafor przed tygodniem, czy, czy wcześniej Secure, jest też wykładowcą inżynierii wstecznej, także jest dzisiaj naszym jeszcze specjalnym gościem, ponieważ na prezentacji przed tygodniem, to było takie ekskluzywne wystąpienie i na tej konferencji brało udział 300 osób, my postanowiliśmy poszerzyć grono odbiorców, bo chcemy się z Wami dzielić wiedzą, chcemy pokazywać jak dzisiejsze aktywności grup cyberprzestępczych czy tych redaktorów sprawiają, że, że ich aktywności gdzieś tam przenikają się z różnymi działaniami zbrojnymi, więc ta cyberprzestrzeń nie jest jakby odrębnym bytem, ale, ale ma wpływ też nasze, na nasze codzienne życie. Prezentacja będzie dotyczyła szczegółów technicznych, można powiedzieć, będzie to rozebranie na czynniki pierwsze ostatnich, ostatnio notowanych ataków, które się właśnie charakteryzują tym, że są coraz bardziej złożone, one są rozłożone w czasie, składają się z wielu właśnie technik, procedur, różnych, różnych taktyk i to nie będzie prezentacja produktowa, jakbyście jesteście przyzwyczajeni do naszych prezentacji i webinarów, gdzie mówimy bardziej o konkretnych rozwiązaniach. Dzisiaj opowiemy właśnie o tym, jak, jakie działania wykonują cyberprzestępczy, mimo że nie ma żadnych dowodów, kto, kto stoi za atakami, chcemy pokazać, jak one przebiegały w czasie. Robert przygotuje prezentację na podstawie badań analityków zespołu ESETA. A jeśli kogoś będzie interesowało, jak technologie ESETA mogą, to można tutaj wykorzystać, jak dozbroić organizację, to na końcu spotkania uruchomię taką ankietę i będzie można zaznaczyć, w jaki sposób poznania bliżej ESETA jest dla Was najwygodniejszy. A pozwólcie teraz, że przejdę na język angielski, na język angielski ponieważ ta prezentacja będzie poprowadzona przez Roberta Lipowskiego w języku angielskim. So, uh, hello Robert, it's again pleasure to have you here and to host you here on our very special webinar. I'm very happy that you agreed to, to share ESET research knowledge, uh, research results with the Polish audience, with the Polish IT security community, uh, as I have already taken a lot of your airtime, so, uh, so the, stage is, the stage is yours and I'll come back by the end of the webinar, so, so good luck. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction and hello everyone. Thanks for tuning in to today's webinar. Um, so the overall theme and, and the, the topic of the webinar is going to be the trends, the current trends in the malware landscape that we are seeing, uh, things that we have seen last year and also the, uh, so extrapolating from that what we expect um, to see and to continue uh, this year as well in 2022. So what are the threats that you should be watching out for? Um, naturally, uh, since the situation happening across the border in Ukraine, um, that also is accompanied by uh, cyber attacks. So that's going to be the main topic that we're going to look at and, and we'll, we'll go over all of the things. Well, some of those things, not all of them, because that will be a uh, two-hour webinar, but we'll go over some of the things that we've been seeing there, the most interesting things. And then in the second part, uh, we'll look at other 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 topics as well, which are also uh, relevant and important to know about. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let's, let's get right to it. So on February 24th, the Russian military forces invaded Ukraine. And on the cyber front, uh, as I said, uh, it's accompanied by cyber attacks as well. Um, so on the cyber front, on the previous day, in fact, just a few hours before the military aggression, we detected 
disruptive wiper malware, malware called Hermetic Wiper in a number of high-profile organizations in Ukraine. But before going into details on Hermetic Wiper, let's take a step back in time because Ukraine has been under heavy fire of cyber attacks for years now. So we've increased and in, we've observed an increase in cyber attacks, um, targeted cyber attacks, APT attacks in the country since around 2014. Uh, and we're not going to pretend that these cyber attacks and the geopolitical conflict in Ukraine are unrelated. No, but we need to make one thing clear. At East said, we're not in a position to make attribution to nation states. That's the role of intelligence agencies. We refrain from speculation and all of the findings uh, that I'm going to be pre presenting to you here uh, and all of the findings that we publish are based on our detection telemetry and on the malware analysis and the research that we've done. And when we attribute an attack, we don't attribute it to a nation state, we attribute it to an APT group, an activity cluster, an operation, or a campaign. Here you can see a list of the most notable APT groups that have carried out targeted campaigns against Ukraine over the years. But this is not a comprehensive list, so this is actually just a tip of the iceberg. These are some of the most notable ones. And in this presentation, we're going to focus on I, I would what I would say is the most infamous of these APT groups, and that's Sandworm, and also known by some of these other aliases, but the most common one used is Sandworm. So I may attribute ready, so uh, this was done by uh, the U.S. Department of Justice and the FBI and the British uh, NCSC. Um, and, and actually, in October 2020, there was an official uh, a public indictment of these six hackers. And uh, this way, uh, they attributed Sandworm to the Russian GRU. We've been tracking the activity of this APT group for many years now. And we've detected more and more campaigns against high-value targets in Ukraine since around the end of 2013. Um, I mean, we have seen attacks prior to that, even in 2012, in, in even I think even earlier, around 2011. But they really intensified towards the end of 2013 toward, and, and, and the beginning of, of 2014. Sandworm targeted all types of organizations, including government, diplomatic, media, transportation. And in terms of uh, TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures, um, and specifically the, the initial access mechanisms. Uh, so one of the main methods Sandworm used to infiltrate high, the, the, the targeted organizations was through carefully crafted, highly targeted spear phishing emails. Here's one example that actually used the war in Donbass as a lure. Uh, in case you don't read Ukrainian, I don't either. So uh, I'm going to translate what this email says. It says, Arsen Yatsenyuk, who was the prime minister at the time, uh, instructs the prosecutor general's office, the security service of Ukraine, the Ministry of Internal Affairs, the Ministry of Justice to check all members of parliament, parties and NGOs in Ukraine for the involvement in the support of rebels in the east of Ukraine. So this was happening um, as the as at, at, at the time a couple months after the war in Donbass started. And in the attachment, there was supposed to be this list of potential these alleged terrorists. So that's what they call these terrorist supporters. Um, and there was, in fact, an attachment. There was a PowerPoint presentation and with a bunch of names there. So um, as you can see, this was very good social engineering here. This was not your common Nigerian prince scam. And as you can probably guess, um, in the background, this would lead to the installation of malware. Um, and this was, this was not one, one of those cases where it relied only on social engineering and, and that you, you would have to you know, uh, enable content in an attachment, enable macros that, that Microsoft Office documents would warn you that it's potentially dangerous. This was actually exploiting a zero-day vulnerability. 
So this, this actually shows the, the level of uh, determination and capabilities of, of the sandworm threat actor. So, so they, they exploited a zero day vulnerability, a previously unknown uh, vulner vulnerability in PowerPoint. Uh, once we discovered it, we, we reported it to Microsoft. It was assigned a CVE number and it was, it was patched. But that at the time that Sandworm was using it, it was a zero day. And, and in the background, it will contact the remote uh, server and then download and install uh, the Black Energy malware. So Black Energy was the malware used in these first campaigns. Um, and it was, Black Energy was used in many campaigns in, against many organizations in Ukraine. Uh, but the most notable attack was against the Ukrainian power grid. This attack was planned for several months in advance. Um, this was not a quick operation, you know, that, you know, get in and, and then and then execute this on the same day. No, this was planned many months in advance um, and it culminated. So so this was just just the culmination, the, the end game of the attack that happened in December 2015. And it became the first ever blackout ever caused by a cyber attack. This attack, um, it was facilitated by the black energy malware. Um, and and I'm, I'm stressing that facilitated part because it wasn't black energy causing the blackout directly, um, but it enabled, it opened the door for the attackers. And it was carried out in a coordinated manner against at least four electric distribution companies in various regions uh, around Ukraine. So this was geographically um, distributed. And, and these, these, these um, distribution companies uh, they are they are they are called Obel Energo. So several Obel Energo companies were were targeted by this. And uh, on December twenty third, twenty fifteen, uh, the attackers then misused um, remote access connections. So one of the remote access software that was installed on these machines, and they misused them to manually switch off, to manually tamper with the controls, to switch off the electricity, and then the homes of around a quarter million Ukrainians across the country went dark for up to six hours. That was the first mass outage caused by a cyber attack, but the attackers didn't stop there. Um, almost exactly one year later in December, 2016, there was another blackout again caused by a cyber attack. Um, and this was, it wasn't just enable as I, as I said in black energy, this was, actually directly done by Indestroyer. Uh, that's what we call, we, we named this malware. And this time the, the attackers, they really stepped up their game. Um, Indestroyer was unlike any other malware that we've previously seen. And it was, it also had, had this first under its belt. So this was the first ever malware specifically designed uh, to attack power grids. And what I mean by is that it was going after these types of devices. So these are examples uh, of protection relays by two different companies, Siemens and ABB. And in Destroyer, uh, it was able to speak the language of, of this industrial hardware, of these protection relays. And uh, they don't communicate using, using you know, regular, uh, regular uh, uh, network protocols as, as on the internet or, or on local networks as we're used to, but these have, uh, they're using special industrial communication protocols and industry actually had an implementation of four of these protocols and then would send commands to these devices to um, effectively de-energize the substation to cause it uh, to power down. And it was also trying to accomplish even more than that. It was trying to uh, cause actual physical damage to these devices, um, which... Uh, we believe it was not successful at doing that. And it was also uh, had other things to uh, intensify its impact uh, and make recovery harder was that it was wiping the control stations the, that were used to monitor and configure these devices. Um, so it also had wiper capability and wiper, and we'll be talking about wipers uh, la later on as well. So. Uh, this was wiping capability, destructive sabotage is kind of a kind of a motive for for sandworm. Then, in the following years, 
there was a lot of evolution of the tool set used by the group. Um, the group split its activities. So there was, um, there was the gray energy cluster, which continued attacks against the energy sector. So we consider gray energy actually a successor to black energy. And then there was another, let's call it a subgroup, uh, which we call telebots. And telebots carried out attacks mainly against the financial sector in Ukraine. And telebots uh, were also behind the infamous Nokia outbreak in June 2017. Uh, I think everybody heard about Nokia. So just a quick recap. So this was fall ransomware. So fake ransomware. By fall ransomware, I mean that it was ransomware. It did encrypt files, but it didn't do it for financial gain. That was just a cover. Uh, its goal was disruption. And in this case, the disruption was enormous. It, it, it affected the whole country uh, of Ukraine. Um, people couldn't buy gas at gas stations. Uh, they couldn't pay at point of sales terminals in supermarkets, uh, as you can see in this photo here. Um, so how uh, was not Petya able to accomplish uh, such uh, widespread damage? What was so special about it? Well, it seemed to attack businesses at random. It wasn't going, it wasn't targeting uh, just, you know, certain high value targets as we've seen with um, black energy in the past, for example, going after government, diplomat, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, not Petya was attacking businesses no matter the size, no matter the industry. So where was this coming from? Um, and we were actually the first to find this initial vector of how everything started. Uh, we can call it patient zero, uh, pardon the pun. And uh, this was financial software. Uh, that was the most, I'll go back one slide. Um, this was the most widely used financial software in Ukraine. Uh, estimates say that um, it was... Uh, it was installed in, in the majority in around 80% of businesses in Ukraine. So this was your accounting software, your, your imagine your most popular accounting software in your country, and it was compromised. So this was a supply chain attack. So this was a legitimate company that the attackers managed to compromise and then, then compromise their update mechanisms, their update servers. And then through, this, through these compromised updates, they were able to install malware on all of these businesses that were clients, uh, users of MEDOC. And then eventually they launched uh, NotPetya through this. But because NotPetya also had additional spreading mechanisms, so it was essentially a worm, it was using a spreading mechanism capable of spreading via the eternal blue exploit. It was able to spread around the network. And eventually, after a few hours, uh, it spread all around the region and, and eventually also globally. This was uh, because many global companies had branches and network connections to Ukraine. So even though the, the most notable, the most visible attacks by Sandworm happened between 2015 and 2017, these, these examples I talked about, um, it's important to keep in mind that the group is actually still active. So they continued carrying out attacks in the following years. Uh, they were not as high impact. They were not as, as highly visible, but they were still carrying out attacks. And, and, and it's still a group to watch out for. And another important note uh, is that while, while Sandworm has primarily targeted Ukraine, they also carried out attacks against other countries um, in the world. And they also carried out attacks against Polish organizations. Um, for example, Gray Energy, which I mentioned, uh, the successor of Black Energy, um, they carried out attacks against uh, a company uh, from the energy sector in Poland uh, in December 2015. And in 2018, they carried out an attacks against a government institution. So uh, Poland was also targeted by Sandworm in the past. Now, let's fast forward and let's take a look at the more, more recent events. Um, in the middle of January, uh, so there were, 
there were new there were discoveries of uh, attacks by malware called Whispergate. Um, but then later, uh, what I already mentioned uh, was was happening uh, just the day before the invasion uh, of Russian military forces in Ukraine. Um, this was a disruptive attack targeting computers in Ukraine. Um, we call it uh, Hermetic Wiper, and it actually started just before 5 p.m. Uh, Ukrainian local time. So it, it preceded the Russian military invasion by just a few hours. Um, we found Hermetic Wiper on hundreds of systems in at least five Ukrainian organizations. It was uh, trying to corrupt their data and make these computer bills inoperable. Uh, they, were, they would not be able to boot uh, after uh, being compromised by Hermetic Wiper. On a more technical level, what it would do was that it would overwrite the master boot record, uh, the master file table, uh, files containing registry keys, wiping several other locations on the drive with uh, random bytes. Um, it also disabled uh, volume shadow copy services to make recovery efforts uh, more difficult. Um, in fact, it was it was a pretty sophisticated uh, wiper, one of the more sophisticated ones that we've seen. It was abusing uh, low-level uh, drivers uh, by a legitimate um, by a legitimate application uh, to enable it uh, to do these uh, low-level uh, file system operations. So it was it was very well um, executed, and it had a timestamp. Uh, the timestamp of the Hermetic Wiper executable showed that it was compiled uh, on December 28th, 2021. So this is this is an indicator. Of course, timestamps can be faked, but uh, this timestamp appears that it could be legit, and that would indicate when the malware was compiled, when it was created, uh, and it also was using uh, a mining circuit. Uh, that's where it also that's where where it got its name from. So uh, the code signing certificate was uh, issued by. Uh, we issue, issued to a uh, again a legitimate company uh, this time, Hermetica, a Cypriot uh, company uh, that wasn't compromised. The working theory is that attackers simply uh, abused their name and uh, pretended to be this company, and then then acquired the certificate from the certificate authority. Um, and uh, this certificate was issued in April, twenty twenty one. So these are these are the indicators that that suggest um, that again the the attack was not so spontaneous, but in fact it was planned well ahead uh, several months uh, before February this year when it was actually launched against those targets. Uh, Hermetic Wiper wasn't the only uh, malware used in this campaign. Um, we uncovered a second piece of malware uh, that was used alongside it. Uh, it this was a worm, uh, Hermetic Wizard. Uh, it tried to reach other, other machines on the local network, and it would try to deploy Hermetic Wiper. So it was used to spread it across the local network. To do so, it, uh, it used WMI and SMB spreaders. So, and, and the third piece of malware uh, was a ransomware. Uh, so we named that Hermetic Ransom. Uh, it was written in the Go language and it was, again, deployed at the same time as Hermetic Wiper. Now, if you think about this, uh, the use of Hermetic Ransom is a bit strange. I mean, why run ransomware when you've wiped the machine? Um, and perhaps this was uh, to hide the wiper's action Perhaps it was a, a backup mechanism in case the wiper fails. So there was another uh, another thing to uh, disrupt the operation through the ransomware. But what's interesting is that uh, the combination of these three pieces of malware effectively did something similar to what NotPetya did in the past. I mean, not on a low level because we didn't uh, we didn't observe any code similarity between these uh, the this hermetic uh, malware. Uh, and and Sandworm uh, and or nor any other APT group, so so uh, we were not able to attribute this Hermetic campaign 
to any other group that we were tracking. But on a high level perspective, it was actually doing, you know, similar, similar things. Um, and even the, um, the SMB spreader in Hermetic Wizard was named uh, Romance DLL. Uh, uh, so perhaps uh, a reference to uh, the Eternal Romance, uh, which was alongside one of the Eternal exploits along with Eternal Blue. So uh, and that was just the first uh, wiper we uncovered recently uh, in uh, as as this uh, Russian invasion was happening um, on the second on the on the day of the invasion. Uh, so on this, on February twenty fourth, uh, we detected a second one. Uh, we called it Isaac Wiper, and then just uh, actually a couple days ago uh, on March fourteenth. Uh, we discovered a third wiper, which we called Caddy Wiper. So the attacks, they are certainly intensifying. Uh, now I'm going to show you a animated demonstration so you can uh, get a better idea of how such targeted attacks uh, happen. And uh, so this is this is a, a mock-up company uh, where you see the, the the network there, you see the bad guy, and we're also going to demonstrate how ESET security solutions are able to uh, catch these threats on uh, in different stages. Uh, the way this demonstration was uh, uh, was uh, prepared was because we're trying we're all, of course blocking the. Uh, the, the the attack from continuing, so we're blocking it uh, ideally in the initial initial phases, and the attack would not continue. So uh, the demo was carried out in such a way that we would disable some of the some of the layers, some of the features, so that the attack would be able to continue in order to demonstrate the layers further down the line. Okay, and I will try to make sure that the video is playing. Just a second. And since PowerPoint is being a bit stubborn, I'm going to play it through a standalone video editor. So I apologize for that. One more try. Okay, so uh, email being, as I already mentioned in the presentation, one of the uh, most commonly used vectors. So that's what the attacker is trying to do here. Uh, they're crafting a spear phishing email and that they, they would send it to one of the organizations. Attach a malicious attachment. and send it over and it would land on uh, the mail server and since we are the the company is using ESET uh, mail security then it would be detected the malware would be uncovered uh, detected this information about the detection and every, every, all, every uh, relevant piece of information would be shown to the administrator in the ESET protect console, as you can see right here. Now, let's switch off the primary primary uh, detection capability. That's our DNA detections. And this time, the malware would not be recognized since this was turned off. And if it's not recognized, it would be sent to our cloud sandbox. Um, 
uh, ESET Dynamic Threat Defense, now known as ESET LiveGuard, um, and it would be run in a safe environment. The malware would be uh, uncovered. It would be decloaked. And again, the administrator would be able uh, to see this detection in his console, see everything relevant. And since this was being run in a sandbox, so it was actually executed, uh, the admin, uh, the network, uh, the person responsible for, for security would be able to see the behavior uh, of that malware as it was executed. But of course, this would not be doing any harm to their systems. Now, since nowadays, uh, many companies don't have on-premise mail servers, but they are using uh, cloud services such as Office 365. So that's the scenario which we are showing here. And uh, thanks to ESA Cloud Office Security, the integration that we have with Office 365, uh, we, we are, uh, the scenario is essentially the same, and we are able to spot the malware even if it's sent to an O365 mailbox as well. Uh, the detection can be seen, as you can see here, in the ESA Cloud Office Security uh, Console. Again, showing the relevant information uh, about the detection, what, what malware was detected, when it happened, uh, any IP addresses, the reason why it was blocked, and so on. Um, ECOS, ESA Cloud Office Security, is not only about Exchange, but it's also uh, covering Teams Group, SharePoint sites, or OneDrive files as well. So let's switch this uh, detection capability off to allow the malware to continue and uh, see the malicious actions that it would do uh, once it would land uh, to the intended, intended recipient's mailbox. So the recipient receives the email. They uh, weren't following their social engineering trainings, so they uh, open it in their in their Word document, and they click on uh, enable macros. And remember, we have DNA detection still turned off, so this would be the the, the first layer that would uh, detect this. Uh, but since DNA detections are turned off, uh, it would be caught by a different uh, detection capability, a different uh, technology, and that's specifically designed to detect exploits. Uh, our exploit blocker, which is even able to uh, detect unknown exploits, so zero days, like I mentioned in the name in the example of Sandworm. When exploit blocker is turned off, the malware would run, would execute, and it would try to call back home, call back to its command and control server, ask for ask what to do, and this network communication would again be detected through one of our uh, network protections, as you've seen. That was the detection prompt over there. So let's switch network protections off. And this time, now the malware would be able to download other commands to download other stages. Uh, so that's the other stage that was downloaded. Uh, it's asking for commands, communicating with its CNC server. Uh, the commands it receives is uh, look for other computers in the network. So it did a network scan. Uh, then it downloads Mimikatz, which is a tool used to dump credentials uh, to dump uh, usernames and passwords and send them to the to the attacker. Uh, now, we allowed all of these actions uh, to happen, and we can see all of these actions in ESET Enterprise Inspector or ESET Enterprise Inspect, our uh, XDR solution. Uh, so you can see all of the uh, all of the alerts that were generated as these malicious actions uh, were happening. Uh, by the way, this scenario, as we were recording this, so these were the actual alerts, the actual uh, ESET Enterprise Inspector uh, detections from our MITRE evaluation uh, that we were doing. So, so these are the uh, detections that we actually uh, had during the MITRE evaluation scenario. Um, it's giving the explanation of, of all the uh, actions. Here you can see this was uh, PowerView being used for reconnaissance. Reconnaissance, that means that was the network scan uh, that, that happened, that we've shown. Uh, it's showing you all the relevant information, including the command line. Uh, you can even see the script, the actual commands, the actual script that the attackers were using. So giving uh, the analyst in the SOC very detailed information uh, so they they have a good
good idea of what was happening in their network and they can investigate uh, everything. Now let's uh, go down the execution chain and there are other command other because um, there were there were several other things that were happening, not just things I've shown in the demo. Um, but I'm going to show you the alert for the Mimikatz, so the password dumping. Uh, you can see the red alert there. So that was Mimikatz actually uh, uh, recognized as Mimikatz. But even if it was not recognized, even if, if it was camouflage, if you, if, even if it was obfuscated, it would still be detected. That's the this orange uh, alert that you can see here because it would detect the behavior of of uh, Mimikatz, so the technique that Mimikatz uses to dump the credentials. So um, now we allowed the attack to continue and the attacker did uh, get these credentials and they're trying to exploit them now. So they would try to uh, RDP to one of the machines, one of the more interesting machines that they are going after. Uh, they enter the stolen credentials that they uh, stole in the previous step. They're writing them here. Uh, for demonstration purposes, I'm using my account, but they will not get in because uh, there is a multi-factor authentication or ESET secure authentication in place, and uh, they did were not able to uh, get this uh, because the uh, prompt is received on a handheld device. So that's a security mechanism saving from this step. So if we turn that off and the attacker would be able to compromise this other machine, uh, they might be able to deploy ransomware uh, there, uh, as we've seen in many of the examples previously with, Nop with uh, Nopetia or the other sandworm attacks. And DNA detection is still off. So this would be our uh, ransomware uh, shield that would catch this ransomware behavior as a general generic detection of ransomware behavior. So there you were, you were able to see that it's important to have many different layers of protection mechanisms in place uh, to catch the attacker's actions. So now I'm going to go back to my PowerPoint slides. And continue with uh, the final part of the presentation where I go over other trends, and um, I'll also focus on uh, financially motivated malware, because now we mostly talk about the situation, what was happening in Ukraine and, and, and Sandworm and all of these other APT groups. So these are uh, nation state level target attacks uh, with the goal of first espionage and second uh, sabotage, but not uh, financial motive. Uh, but financially motivated threats, so e-crime, that's still a major problem, a problem for uh, users and, and, and companies of all sizes, from consumers to small, medium businesses to largest uh, enterprises and organizations. Uh, they are equally targeted. Well, not exactly equally because the, the ransomware attacks are actually favoring larger corporations, uh, but still regular, uh, regular users are... Uh, targeted by these financially motivated threats as well. Um, so this is one of the trends that we have been seeing um, throughout last year. Uh, and that was, and, and not only throughout last year, but actually actually over the past two years uh, since the beginning of the pandemic. And that's the enormous rise in brute force attacks against RDP, uh, against remote desktop protocol. Um, attackers will either try to steal uh, RDP credentials, like I've shown you in the demo, or they will try to brute force their way in. So they would try to uh, guess the passwords by brute force. Um, and the numbers really, really took a, took a high rise, especially towards the end of uh, last year. But if we do a year by year comparison, it's an even more alarming trend. So while in 2020, there was already a huge, huge increase, um, and, and that was 29 billion brute force attempts, um, 
that was with you know all the chaos, the the transition to working remotely, and and RDP was on the rise. So so people were using remote uh, remote connections to 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 connect to their uh, machines at work from home, and there was abuse of this. Uh, so so they they were carrying many more of these attacks. But then in 2021, this this exploded entirely, and and we blocked. Uh, 288 billion attack attempts in 2021. So that's it's almost a tenfold increase in absolute numbers, uh, almost 900 increase year over year. So these RDP brute force attacks, they're they're um, a way of the cyber criminals of getting in, and this is actually the most common mechanisms for deploying ransomware in the targeted organizations. Speaking of ransomware, uh, one trend that we have been seeing in the past is that the attackers have been getting more and more aggressive. Um, they would not stop uh, stop by they would not stop by anything. Um, they would even target hospitals in the times of the pandemic. So uh, terrible thing to do. Uh, even though some of the groups actually claimed that they would not be doing that, but they still were doing it. Um, and we've even seen some of the record demands for ransoms uh, to, to be paid out. Uh, some of the companies did pay the ransoms, and I think the, the highest publicly known numbers are around 40 or 50 million US dollars uh, being paid in ransom. Uh, or, in, as you can see in this example, uh, in this... Uh, uh, compromise or, or this extortion from uh, EU's uh, electronic retailer Media Markt, uh, they were demanded to pay $240 million. So that was the highest ransom uh, demand uh, today that we know. There is no information on whether they paid or not. Uh, my guess would be that they didn't actually. These ransomware gangs, these ransomware groups are typically quite open to negotiations. So they would try to request such enormous. Uh, numbers and and try to try to see how much money then they can they can make but as i mentioned some of these other examples 40 50 million dollars were publicly uh claimed by by um, the organizations that those ransoms have been paid so uh sticking with e-crime sticking with cyber criminal groups um you might remember how in january last year Law enforcement took down Emotet, so one of the most notable uh, e-crime groups. Then there was an uninstallation of, of Emotet, a coordinated law enforcement action to uninstall it in April. Uh, well, forget about these efforts because Emotet is back. Um, this malware was described actually by Europol as the most dangerous malware in the world. Um, and, and it came back from the dead in uh, the final months of the last, the last year. Um, so this resurrection campaign popped up in our telemetry on November 16th, and detections were coming in actually from around 80 countries. But these attacks, they're not limited only to desktop computers. Um, mobile devices are targeted, targeted as well, especially Android. And in the past... Um, the majority of Android threats weren't really that serious. I mean, they, they were a problem, of course, but they were not as malicious, malicious as, you know, regular Trojans. So they were typically like, you know, various adware or potentially unwanted applications and things like that. So things, things you really shouldn't want and shouldn't have on your device, but it was not as, as dangerous as, as regular malware. Uh, but that's actually the example that I want to show you here. So um, we've seen a really huge rise uh, uh, in banking malware. So this this is, I would say, the most dangerous thing that you can get on your mobile device. So this is the malware that you're uh, that's going after your banking credentials, taking sc screenshots, uh, uh, and and basically exploiting the fact that more and more people are banking from their phones rather than their 
computers, their, their desktop devices. So uh, we've seen a staggering 428% increase um, of Android banking malware year over year. Okay, to, so to finish off, I already uh, mentioned and show you how we should be defending from these types of attacks, which have been getting more and more aggressive. Uh, so I've, I've, I've shown you the demonstration, show you the, the um, detections on at the various stages, various levels. Uh, in this diagram, you can see some of those detection technologies uh, that we have. This is specifically on the endpoint. And, and it's our philosophy that having this multi-layered approach is the only viable approach uh, for effective defense. Um, as you can see here, these concentric circles, so, so these are the various layers which are designed to uh, detect the attack at various uh, stages of the attack. Um, so whether it's pre-execution, so that's ideally where we want to catch it, or if the attack... Um, does manage manage to execute so there there is execution or even post execution stages after the fact um and uh this basically ties into the whole um ESET security ecosystem so these are all the various layers uh that we have in place uh, various uh, technologies and various solutions uh, to be able to um protect organizations of all sizes Okay, so uh, for daily portion of ESET research, in case uh, this was of interest to you, which I hope it was, um, I invite you to, to uh, visit uh, our website, our blog, uh, welivesecurity.com, uh, to uh, also follow uh, the other great webinars, which are organized by Dagma. I invite you to follow our ESET research Twitter account, so that's actually the most up-to-date um, research, uh, most up-to-date uh, news coming from our lab, uh, from the research, uh, some more technical, some less technical. And uh, for in-depth in and most importantly, actionable threat intelligence, so that includes IOCs, Yara rules, SNORT rules, uh, I recommend our private threat intelligence offering. And with that, I thank you all for listening. Um, and I think we can open up for Q&A uh, in case some of you want to contact me afterwards. So these are some of my contacts here. So okay, great. <laughs> great, Robert. Yeah, uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Uh, that was, again, great to, to see uh, how the attack can look like and uh, I mean step by step how ATP groups act and what they do to get into the organization and finally launch the 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 execution the the execution stage of the the, the attack. I think it was both terrifying but also it should not lead us to to any way of, of panic but maybe to to rethink or reshape or reevaluate the the company posture according to the cyber technology uh, technologies. Uh, I'm taking a look on the chat, but there's no questions uh, right now. So uh, I think uh, we have one question to the, our participant. This is my last part, but many thanks for your time uh, here with, with us. Uh, and I would like you to, to, I would like wish you to enjoy your vacations in Panama and enjoy the, probably the breakfast at this is a very early morning in Panama uh, right now where, where you are, where you are. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So if, if I would, if you were to take away one message from this whole talk, exactly as, as you were saying, um, users should not be worried. They should not panic, but they should be prepared. Yeah. Oh, there's uh, one question pop up uh, from Krzysztof. Yes, the, there was last last minute to, to ask this question. And were ESET solution able to discover and block those zero day attacks? So this was the, the question. Uh, yes, yes, we have. I, I don't know whether this was particularly uh, flagged by exploit blocker, uh, but uh, yes, we did detect this, uh, this malware, block it 
and uh, and then of course we did our due to, um, you know the responsible thing to do so reported it to Microsoft so that they would be able to patch it even for you know the wider community okay super E, Robert wspominał o dostępie do informacji też na portalach Willip Security e, czy na, tu, na koncie ESETA na Twitterze. E, ostatnio został uruchomiony też podcast na różnych platformach podcastowych, także znajdziecie też dla tych, którzy preferują e, wersję na słuchawkach dostępu do tych informacji. My bardzo dziękujemy wszystkim za udział w tym dzisiejszym spotkaniu. Dla tych z Was, którzy chcieliby jeszcze brać udział w kolejnych naszych darmowych webinarach, ten teraz uruchamiam taką ankietę, jakie treści Was najbardziej interesują, żebyśmy mogli wspólnie z, z analitykami ESETA przygotowywać dla Was takie, takie materiały, ale jeżeli ktoś czuje potrzebę, żeby rzucić okiem na to, co ESET po, pozwala dostarczać, jeśli chodzi o różne technologie, być może to może być temat taki mocno wiodący na, na czasie, takie jak chociażby rozwiązania klasy klasy EDR, to proszę też zaznaczcie nam na ankietach, właśnie uruchamiam te ankiety, one powinny się już uruchomić na waszych, na waszych ekranach, także my bardzo, bardzo dziękujemy za, za was udział. And uh, once again, thank you, Robert. Have a great vacations and see you, see you again later with our uh, newest webinars. Yeah. Dziękuję bardzo. <laughs> great.